welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Tonight we're going to get in the word and like I said, we're, we're glad you're here. We, we have a saying that you're never a stranger in your father's house. That's true. We know you could be anywhere tonight. Jim and I started this church 24 years ago, so if you've never heard a woman preach, it's okay. If God can use a jackass, he can certainly use an old lady. So it's all right. And I've got a word tonight from God. And so if you've got your Bibles, we're going to turn into the book of Revelation, and then we're going to go over to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to be all over tonight. I've preached out of this passage many times, but it continually speaks to me personally. And I remember Pastor Jack Hayford at a pastor's conference Jim and I were at years ago said that you feed people by God ministering and feeding you. So this is something that I've been dealing with, something that I've been living. And so I'm going to be sharing it with you tonight. Revelation, we're going to be looking at chapter 2. But before we get into the word, I'm going to open us up in prayer tonight. Father, thank you for the anointing that breaks yokes and lifts burdens. Thank you for the living word of God that is alive, that your word has the power to bring every promise to pass, that it is corrective, it is faith building, it overwhelms and overcomes our enemy. Thank you for the living, breathing word of God, and thank you for the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit. So Holy Father, tonight we humbly ask that as we open your word, you'd open our hearts. That you would give me with the ability to make this clear and simple and plain. And Lord, we pray for all the churches tonight in the Inland Empire that are bold enough to have a service. Lord, bless them tonight. Those that name Jesus as Lord. Father, anoint their services. Minister to their people. Do what only you can do, Holy Spirit. And we thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're in the book of Revelation chapter 2, I'm going to start out with just a quote from John Wesley. And John Wesley was the son of Susanna Wesley. His father was a, a pastor, a preacher. And John and Charles Wesley are known as the founders of the Methodist denomination. And John and Charles were in the colonies in the early 1700s. And there was a man named Jonathan Edwards who had preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hand of an Angry God. And it was there at that place, and in that time, God fell on that place, and John, West Charles were there, and as John Edwards preached that message, it is said that the people that were hearing and were actually in that meeting house, there were posts that were holding up the roof, and they were grabbing onto the posts and hanging on for dear life, because it felt like the very floor of that meeting house was falling into the fires and the flames of hell and they could feel the heat and it was there that revival broke out in the colonies and the colonies were forever changed. Now we're coming up on July 4th. John and Charles went back to England and there they took that spark and that flame and that revival fire and it went into England and changed England forever and changed the world. So that's who John Wesley is and this is what he said. When I was young I was sure of everything. In a few years, having been mistaken a thousand times, I was not half so sure of most things as I was before. At present, I am hardly sure of anything but what God has revealed to me. And I think that's a great, great quote. Because it seems like the older you get in the Lord, and the more you walk with the Lord, the less you seem to really know. And there is a phenomena in mountain climbing, and it's the phenomena of looking at the peak or the summit where you're about to climb. And as you are further away from the peak, you can see the top of that mountain. But as you get closer and closer to your destination, that mountain peak gets larger and larger, and you can't see the top of it. And it's just like that with God. The closer we get, the bigger he is. And we are on a journey and a destination, and we are, all of us, walking a narrow path with him. And tonight I want to speak to you about fueling or refueling the flames of love. And tonight I'm going to be talking about a word, cynicism, and looking at some things. And I want to share from my own testimony, and then we're going to go from there. But let's just go to Revelation, and we're looking at 
again a letter, and we've been here many times before, and I've alluded to this scripture many, many times. But I want to open it up again tonight because, again, it is speaking to me, and so therefore I want to speak it to you. And John is on the Isle of Patmos, and that is where he has met Jesus Christ and the revelation of Jesus Christ because the book of Revelation is not a book about the last days or the end times as much as it is a revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what the book is about. And he has seen the Lord, and he has seen him in his glory and his majesty in chapter 1. And he's fallen at his feet. And he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he said, and he laid his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. Write the things which you have seen, the things which you are, the things which are, and the things which will take place. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So John has seen a vision of Jesus and in Jesus' hand he's had seven stars and he's holding a lampstand. And now Jesus is explaining this to him and he says the seven golden lampstands are the churches. And the seven stars are the messengers. That word messenger is angelos, which means angels. But in this case, it means messenger, which means pastors. So Jesus, in all of his glory and his resurrection, is writing seven letters to seven churches. And this is what he says. And this is the first letter. And he says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Those would be the seven pastors who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, those would be the seven churches. These were seven real churches on the planet. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have preserved or persevered, and you have patience, and you have labored for my name's sake, and you've not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Now, tonight I'm talking about refueling the flames of love, and I'm talking about what Jesus said to do, and how do I know that I'm not as passionate as I used to be? How do I know that I may think I'm going forward, but in reality, I'm actually going backward? And you know, Jesus is attending the flame of his churches. He is the head of the church. He writes these letters to the churches. Out of the seven, two are not corrected. They are encouraged and comforted because of persecution and because they're walking in the love of God. And they're small and powerless except for his love. But the other five he corrects and he challenges and he speaks to them. And you know, Dan preached this morning about the word of God. Not only is the word of God building our faith, but it's also corrective. It says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the word of God is profitable for correction, for rebuke. For doctrine, for training, that the word of God and the man of God and the woman of God, that we would become perfect and mature. You see, God is, is, is wanting us to grow up. He doesn't want us to stay immature believers that cannot be entrusted with the power of God or the kingdom of God. Because he's the head and we're the body. And if God is going to conceive his will in us, and if the word made flesh, Jesus is going to declare his word through us, and if the spirit of God is going to create the miracles by us, then we'd better grow up and we'd better learn what we're supposed to do and be the church. And Paul warned about the last days, and he said that there's going to be perilous times. There's going to be things that are going to be hard to deal with. People are going to get offended. People are going to have bitching ears. There's going to be perilous times. Jesus said, look, in the world you're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, don't be weary in well-doing. Look what it says. Don't grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So the enemy is after our hearts. And so is Jesus. 
And that is why I want to look at this because this is not just instructive, but it's corrective. And then it tells us how to change. So tonight I want to look at refueling the fires of love. Now let's just take a look at this church for a second. I know your works, verse 2, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. They're a good church. You've tested those who say they are apostles and are not. Now, this is Ephesus. You can read about Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. There's a massive riot there because in Ephesus there was a temple of Diana. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And Diana was Art- Artemis or the Venus, the goddess of love, fertility. And there was a massive following in Ephesus. Massive. There, her temple was there. It was, like I said, it was known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. You can still see the pillars going all the way to the ocean in Ephesus today. And Paul is there, and there's a riot there over Christianity. I mean, it was, it was known to be one of the largest churches, if not the largest church in the Gentile nations. And so Ephesus has it going. Ephesus has faced some persecution. Ephesus has really hunkered down and believed God in the midst of idolatry. And he says, listen, you've tested apostles. They knew Paul started that church. He lived with them for two years. He taught them everything he knew. And then he sends Timothy, and he writes two letters to Timothy about taking over the church at Ephesus. There's a lot in the word about Ephesus. He says, you are a good church. You can't bear those who are evil. You've tested those. You found them liars. You've persevered and you have patience. You've labored for my, na- my name's sake. And you've not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You've left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Now, they thought they were doing okay. But Jesus says, you've fallen. Repent. And do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Now, Jesus isn't going to remove their salvation, but he's going to remove the fire and the flame and the influence. We are a city on a hill. We are the light, he said, that shines the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the kingdom of God. And if you feel like You've lost some influence. If you feel like you're not as passionate or on fire as you used to be, if you feel like maybe some things have happened and your flame has cooled down a little bit, then I want to talk to you tonight because that's what happened to Ephesus. And God tells us what's happening and tells us how to correct it. So you want to hear what's going on. Now, there's a couple of reasons why we can cool off and lose our heart and lose our passion for ministry, for the things of God, for the word of God, for decreeing the word of God, praying, declaring the word of God, serving in the house, all of these things, especially those that have walked with Jesus for a long time. It's, it's a subtle thing. But once again, the enemy is out to steal our heart in any way that he can because if he steals my heart, he steals my flame. If he steals my light, he steals my influence. And then he doesn't care what I do because I no longer am shining. So let's look at some things. Now we're going to look at four R's because Jesus lays this out. He says, remember, repent, and return. Real simple stuff. Remember, repent, and return. And I want to look tonight at some things about this. So what does cause me to lose my influence? What leads me away from passion? Well, there's a couple of things. They were busy. They were loveless. They've left their first love. They were busy with the work. They'd been occupied with the work. But they weren't occupied with Jesus. And that's a subtle thing. You can get used to coming to church. You know, in all churches, I opened this up with John Wesley and Charles Wesley, Jonathan Edwards, the revival in the colonies in England. Do you know that every denomination has started out in revival? Everyone, God breathes and there is fire and it lights up. And then it moves. You can track it. It moves from revival and then the movement moves to credibility. It's so subtle. Now we've got to be respectable. Now we've got to get credible because we're big. Why, we've got a name for ourselves. 
We've got to behave ourselves. And then it moves from credibility to institutionalism. And then it dies. And there's nothing left but formal religion. And don't think it can't happen here. Don't think it can't happen to the rock. And it's up to the leadership and the pastors and the congregation to make sure that we don't lose our first love. That we understand what it is. We understand what we're to do and to check ourselves because this is not just a teaching, but this is a corrective word from Jesus, the head of the church, who is tending the flame of his churches, who wants his churches a flame and a fire because he's the head, but we are the body of Christ on the earth. And he has made a blood covenant with you and I not to separate from us, and we alone can separate from him. So a couple of things. We can get too busy with just the work, and before you know it, we've got rules and regulations and laws, and we become very respectable. Listen, life is messy. God told us to roll up our sleeves and get dirty with everybody else. It doesn't mean that I get into sin, but it means that I get in where the sinner is. Because if I stop doing that, then I'm becoming credible. And when I, so I begin to be credible, guess what? Now flesh has taken over and not the spirit. Hello? Now remember, I'm not saying this is us. I'm just saying this is a warning, and I want to heed it. What can cause me to lose and to lose my influence? Well, not just overworking and being busy with the things that we know how to do, are used to, coming to church all the time, the services, we know what's in the service. We don't have a bulletin, but we might as well because this is what we do. And it can get very traditional. Are you hearing me? I, can I just be honest with you tonight? Can this pastor's wife just be honest? Well, if it can happen there, it can happen here. This is how we do this. Why break what's not broken? Another thing that can happen is we can get offended. You know, people can let you down. People can hurt you. People can really mess with your head. You can dig in and work and give your heart and give your life. And then, boom, something blows up in your face. And before you know it, your heart, it's just broken. Or things aren't what, they, what you thought they were going to be. Well, what happened? This isn't how I prayed. This isn't what I asked for. This isn't what I thought. Anybody ever been there? Well, there was somebody that was there, and his name was John the Baptist. And in Matthew chapter 11, I'm talking about offenses, and I'm, talking about, I'm going to talk about being cynical in just a minute. But in Matthew chapter 11, if you'll go there with me, John the Baptist, he's in prison. I'm talking about losing our hearts, losing our first love. Subtle. John the Baptist is offended. And he's in prison, and he sends his disciples. And he says in, in Matthew, Matthew chapter 11, it says he's in prison. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And John heard in prison about the works of Christ. He sent two of his disciples, and he said, Are you the coming one, or do we look for the other? Or, we do, look for, or do we look for another? Wait, John, you baptized him. You said, This is he. But now he's in prison. He's about to lose his life. Things aren't turning out. His eschatology isn't right. He thought that Messiah, yeah, he knew Jesus was Messiah, but he was supposed to come with the kingdom, come in power. And now John's in prison, and it's not looking good. You see, sometimes in our Christianity, it doesn't happen like we think it's supposed to happen. We're working. We're doing. How come? I thought it was going to be like this, but this is how it's turned out. Are you really the one? Are you sure? You see, before you know it, when things don't happen the way you think they are, without you even seeing it, you can begin to step back, and you can begin to doubt, and you can begin to walk away, and you don't even know you're walking away. Now, Jesus doesn't rebuke John. He actually commends him, and he says, go and tell John, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers, and the, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them, and this is where I want to go. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Offenses are going to come, and they're going to break your heart, and they're going to disappoint you. We prayed for a young man last Sunday, and we're going to bury that young man and do his memorial next Friday. 
This happens all the time. That's why churches stop praying for the sick. You pray for something and it doesn't happen. You fight and you fight and you work and you work and you wonder, Lord, where are you? Have you ever been there? John was there and Jesus said, go and tell him. I am the one, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And then he goes on to say, who was John? What did you go out to see, a reed shaken in the wind, someone in king's clothes? This is what he says about John. He says, assuredly, I say to you, verse 11, among those born of women, there was not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He's not putting John down. He knows and he understands. He's the son of man. He gets us. But now he's corrected and he says, you've lost your first love. You've worked hard, but you're occupied with the work and you're not occupied with me. You've gotten offended. You've allowed doubt and unbelief to come in. And this is what happens. You become cynical. Cynical. What a word. I looked up the word cynical because this is what God spoke to me. It means pessimistic, mocking, skeptical, sarcastic, distrustful, suspicious, contemptuous, disparaging, distracting, sneering, scornful, derisive, negative, scoffing, cynical. Before you know it, the very thing that you were called to is the very thing that now you're getting a little jaded. And the people that you're called to love, because we're going to see this in a minute, are the very ones that you no longer respect, are the call, or the ministry. Are you hearing me? He says, you've left your first love, but wait, we're busy. Yeah, you're busy, but you're busy with what? Are you busy with my heart? Are you busy with the busyness of the work? Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is where I was. This is where God is taking me out of. Cynical, pessimistic, skeptical, sarcastic, distrustful, suspicious, contemptuous. You know what contemptuous means? I looked this up. It means disapproving and disrespectful. The opposite of contemptuous is naive and childlike. The opposite of disrespectful is respectful. So if it's possible to get busy because of the work or to get offended because of the persecution and the trials of Christianity, because who told us this was going to be easy? Who told us we were going to be popular? Who told us that everything was going to be perfect? The first church was in the flames of persecution. And you think we're going to go out with any less trouble? Satan's going to make sure he can do everything he can to steal the anointing from our lives. So we better grow up and get tough. And this is what it says. Disapproving and disrespectful. The opposite is naive. So Jesus says, listen, you're going to have to go back and look at where you've been and return. He says, remember where you have fallen from. Repent and return. You see, he said, you've left your first love. Now, here's the deal, guys. Love is never lost. Love is left. Love is never lost. Love is left. Love is never lost. You can't lose love because the love of God is not a feeling. It's a fact and it's a person. But you can leave the love of God. And that's what's happened here. This church doesn't even know it. God says, Debbie, have you lost your innocence? Have you lost the passion for the call of God? The very thing I've called you to is now the thing you're starting to disrespect. You look at your city with disdain. You drive down the neighborhoods and you say, oh, this city's getting worse. Don't want to live here. What about the people that are coming? What about all the problems? Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is where God's called me. This is where God's called this church. And it's so easy and it's so subtle to turn your 
face away from the very thing that Jesus loves the very most. And before you know it, you become a bit cynical and a bit offended. And the flame that was once burning is no longer burning as brightly. And the service that you once did and the ministries that you couldn't wait to get here to do and the word that you couldn't wait to open and hear and the songs that you couldn't wait to sing and the church that you couldn't wait to clean. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And the family that you couldn't wait to see restored, all of a sudden now you're seeing things that are negative, that are pessimistic, that are jaded. And this can work with marriages, families, and churches. Are you hearing me? You all right with me? Love is not lost, love is left. Because agape love is not a feeling, it's a choice. What does the word mean, left? It means to send away, to neglect, to forsake, to leave. Jesus said, you've left your first love. You've neglected, you've forsaken. You have walked away from that which was impassioned over you, which filled your life. God loves us by choice, based on his nature of love, independent of whether we deserved it, earned it, or anything worthy of it. It has nothing to do with us and everything to do with him. Let me read it again. God's love, his agape love, the love that he's talking about is not a love of feeling. It is a love of choice. That's why you can't lose it. You can only leave it. Because it's not about your feelings. This has nothing to do with how we feel. It has nothing to do with whether we're happy or sad or disgusted or not disgusted. But it has everything to do with what we choose to do. Love is personal self-sacrifice. Love is a giving of myself for the betterment of someone else. And when I stop doing that and when I stop seeing that and when that stops being the passion of my life, then I've begun to lose my flame and I've begun to walk away from my first love. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to have to love them. Love me, love people. Love me, love your city. Love me, love. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So this is what he says. Romans 5:8 in the message says, but God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death. Well, we are of no use whatever to him. God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death. Well, we were of no use whatever to him. Listen, I had a dream last week. I don't want to be a spectacle in front of you. But I woke up crying so hard that my husband said, what's wrong, what's wrong? I told him I missed ministry. I told him I was missing some things and I didn't know what to do and I had to actually go out and I had to go look at the stars. I had to reconnect with God because it was so troubling to me and I was crying so hard, wasn't I, Jim? I was in travail. I was weeping. I, was, I woke up weeping, weeping. And I was sad. I was so sad. And the Spirit of God has been showing me this week what that dream was. What's been happening subtly is that as, as I'm aging and as I'm growing and as I've been blessed and as I've been elevated, I mean, I've been all over the world and we preach this church has grown, that there was a part of me, the passion to serve, the passion to do this and the passion to that, that it subtly just started to diminish. And without knowing it, I was leaving the very thing that he birthed in me to be here for, and I was so sad, I was so sad. Church, if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. It can happen to us. God loves us by choice, not by feeling. Don't let the respect and reverence for the position that God's put you in leave your heart, the call of God, the call of God. Oh, my gosh. Ephesians 4, 1 says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, appeal to and beg you to walk and lead a life worthy of the divine calling to which you have been called, with behavior that is a credit to the summons to God's service, living as becomes you with complete lowliness of mind, humility, meekness, unselfish gentleness, 
mildness, with patience, bearing with one another and making allowances because you love one another. Not looking at what's wrong with people, but looking at what's right with people. Not looking at what neighborhoods are coming in or who's on the buses or how much we need or how much, how much need there is. There is so much need. Sometimes it can get overwhelming. I am really being honest with you tonight, but I really hope this is saying something to us. And I am making a spectacle of myself, but I don't care. Because when this church was birthed, it was birthed with 12 people in a box of Kleenex with broken hearts. And I pray that this next generation that's taking this church will have their own breaking hearts for our city, for our nation, for our state, for this planet, because our world is troubled and it's hurting. And if I am indifferent, and if I'm just busy with the work and I'm not busy with the heart of God, how can there be any annoying or flame or passion or life that will come out of us? We'll be respectable. Well, that's Jim and Debbie Cobra, and this is the Rock Church, and it's a big church. So what? Is it the heart of God? Is the Rock doing what God's called us to do? Are our people growing? Are we loving each other? Are our families being healed? Are our marriages strong? Are our children safe and protected? Because we're a family, and it means I got to get in the mess. Because if I don't get in the mess to help, who's going to help? If you don't get in the mess to help, who's going to help? If I'm too busy with my own life, my own comforts, my own agendas, who is going to do it? This church was birthed with that passion of love, the first love. And I pray that this passion and this love will be birthed again. I've repented. I've been with God. And I'm not sad anymore, but I'll tell you what, there's a fear of God on me. So if I'm cynical, if I've gotten busy with the work of being a Christian, but not busy with the heart of the king, I've left my first love. And he says, remember where you have fallen from. What does it mean? It means remember what you felt like when you first got saved. Remember what you felt like when you first came. Remember what you felt like and what you were willing to do. Remember how hungry you were. Remember how hungry you were for God's word. Remember how hungry you were to pray. Remember when there was trouble and you got on your knees and you prayed out loud and you spoke the word and you did all these things. And then God rescued that family and rescued your family and did this and did that. And now there's comfort and there's ease. Are you hearing me? Remember. Because you don't lose it. You leave it, and you don't even know you've left because they didn't know until Jesus told them. He says, remember. Then he says, repent. Repent means turn, change, change your perspective. We don't see things as they are. We see things as we are. We look through the lens of our heart. They didn't know that they'd left their first love. Their perspective was skewed. Jesus said, repent. Repent. Change your perspective. Understand that you began in the spirit and you cannot continue doing this in the flesh. You can't love people like you need to love them, Debbie. With hard work, you can only do this by one thing and one thing only. By the grace of God. God's power in me to do what his truth demands of me. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. Yes, hard times are coming. Yes, you've been hurt. Yes, people have let us down. Yes, this has happened. Yes, we're getting old. Yes, we're getting tired. Yes, my body aches. But since when does that give me an excuse to stop? When? When does God say it's over? When does God say no more work for you? Not till I close my eyes and I go home. Not till you close your eyes and go home. Repent. What does it mean? C.S. Lewis says many things such as loving, going to sleep, or behaving unaffectedly are done worst when we try the hardest to do them. We can't do this in our strength. We can't be this church of the next generation in our own strength. God's taken us so far, but if we're going to break through, if we're going to get to the next level, 
if we're going to dream the dreams of the Holy Spirit for this house, and if we're going to see what God wants to see in this house for the next generation, to pay this church off, to build what hasn't been built, to go where we have not yet gone, and to do what we have not yet done, we are going to have to do this by one thing and one thing alone, by the grace of the living God, because we cannot do this in our own strength. Let grace do its work. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 12 says, And least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. Paul writing, A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan. He asked God three times to get it out of his life, and God said, No. I'm not getting the devil out of your life. I'm getting grace in your life so that you learn how to work the kingdom of God. My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities. I'll boast in my weaknesses. I'll boast in what I've done wrong. I'll boast in what I cannot do. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, weaknesses, and strongholds in my life that I can't seem to fix. Persecutions that keep coming. The buffeting that comes as a believer and a leader. It reproaches and needs and needs and needs. Are you in need? Is it over and over and over again? Are you weary of it? Do you want to walk away sometimes? Do you want to say, it's enough, God. I can't take care of anybody else. I can hardly take care of myself. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? I am making such a fool of myself tonight. take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You and I cannot love our city to life. We can't love the stranger. We can't love the orphan. We can't help the marriage. We can't do anything in our own strength. Because when we try, we judge and we resent and we get cynical and we don't even know it. And we get pessimistic, disrespectful. And God says, I need you fresh and naive and childlike. I need you innocent again, child, as if nothing ever happened to you. As if you're starting all over again. With fresh eyes of faith and a fresh healed heart. To get back into the fight and get back into the bottle. John the Baptist said, are you the Christ? He was in a bad place, but Jesus didn't rebuke him. He said, John the Baptist, of one born of woman, there's not one greater. But you who are at least in the kingdom are greater than he. The privilege of what we have. He says you're going to have to, number one, remember where you've fallen. Am I living called or am I living saved? Called means my life fits into his will. Saved means his will fits into my life. Saved or called? Where are you living? To respect the call of God, the privilege of the kingdom, the privilege of the king. Remember where you've fallen. Repent. We can't do this in our own strength. Let grace do it. The power of grace. Listen to this. I've got to quit. Success is not measured by how much fruit I produce, how big my church is, how good my children are, how much money I earn, how much material gain I have. How far I go up the corporate ladder. How many friends love me. Success is measured by one thing and one thing alone. Who loves me? And his name is Jesus. Success is measured by who I am, not what I do. I'm a child of God. It's not my ability to produce, but my position as a child of God. My performance does not change the stability of my position. What am I saying? When you get weary, when you think you can't do it, you're in a good place because you can't. Now you're at the end of yourself, and now you come to the beginning of God. Because he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When I run out of steam and I run out of me, I come to the beginning of God. And in my weakness, his strength is made perfect. So you're tired, you're weary, might be a good place to be. You're jaded, you're a little disillusioned, might be a good place to be because get ready. God says, change. By the power of grace, act like I love others. This is all changing my perspective. This is, I'm reading CS, but this is what he said. Do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Don't waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, 
we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love them. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Is there going to be more work ahead? Harder work than we've ever done? Harder times maybe than we've ever faced? More things to believe God for than we've ever believed. You better believe it. But guess what? That's the exciting part of this adventure. Is that God wants us to rise up and get going and understand that we can't, but he can't. He's just looking for a church that won't walk away from their first love. They will walk right back into it and say, here I am. Choose me. I will respect the call of God. I will respect the anointing of the spirit of God. I will come and believe the kingdom of God and bring your kingdom to this earth every way I can. He says, remember where you've fallen from. Repent. And this is the last thing. He says, return. Return. Get back. Come back. Because you can't lose love. You can only leave it. You can't lose God's love. You can only leave God's love because it's not a feeling. It's a choice. And you can't make him not love you. But you and I can walk away from his love. How do I do that? I do that when I stop loving people. First John 4, 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. God abides in us. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been perfected in us. This is so simple. This is not rocket science. It just means we get in, roll up our sleeves, get ready to get dirty and tired again. Starting with brand new fresh eyes. Some of us return. Return to faith. Return to obedience. Return to the war. Return to the war. Can I finish this? John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 11 said, are you the one? Jesus said, go and tell him the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. And blessed is he who is not offended in me. Then he goes on in Matthew 11. It's an amazing chapter. He says, of those born of woman, John the Baptist is the greatest of all the prophets. Moses, Elijah, Elisha. John the Baptist is the greatest born of woman. Yet those who are least in the kingdom of God are greater than he. What is he saying? He's saying, there's a kingdom that I've come to give. I'm the king and I'm bringing the kingdom. And this kingdom has so far surpassed the privilege of the old covenant, the kingdom that they tasted, that the least born in this new kingdom is going to be greater than John the Baptist, who was the greatest of any prophet born of a woman. That means greater than Moses. You and I have more privilege, more power available, and more anointing than John the Baptist, Elijah, Elisha, Moses, Malachi, Micah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amos, Hosea, Go ahead and list the prophets of God. He says we have more privilege, more position, and more power. But he says you got to come back. you got to get back into the fight. Get back into faith. Get back into love. And this is what he says. Verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elisha who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What is God saying? I used to teach this. That the kingdom of God suffers violent and the violent take it by force. Yeah, let's go get it. Then I began to teach on the kingdom of God and I realized that there's two powers at work. There's kingdom of darkness and there's the kingdom of God. Kingdom of darkness, the power that works in the kingdom of darkness, Satan's kingdom, is something called force. It is power under the flesh. That's why we have wars. 
That's why God in this dispensation has ordered military and police to enforce the law because we are under a dispensation of darkness and there is force and evil prospers when good men do nothing. We have to have force right now. But Jesus demonstrated something. He said, I'm bringing the kingdom and there's a brand new power that you've never seen. There's a power that you don't understand. There's a power that is not earthly. There is a power that you don't think is anything and it's called the power of meekness. Meekness is power under the control of agape love. He demonstrated this power at the cross when he laid his life down. He became the lamb, and the lamb swallowed up the serpent and took the keys of death and hell. He did not do it by human force. He did it by the power of the love of God. Meekness, power under the control of love. We think meekness is weak. We think it means we're a doormat. It doesn't mean anything of the same. That's why Jesus says, turn the other cheek. He says, do they want your coat? Give them your cloak. Pray for your enemies. Overcome evil with good because we can't do this in the flesh. This is not about political structures. This is not about who's in office. This is not about who's the biggest church. This is about the kingdom of God, the power of God, the power of love, meekness, power under control of the agape of God. And when you and I begin to overwhelm darkness with that, now we are the force of God on the earth, ruling over everything that wants to take out humanity. Rock Church, we've only just begun. I'm glad God gave me that dream. I'm glad God let me wake up in travail. I'm glad God let me see. You can walk away from this, and you can miss destiny for the rest of your life. I'm grateful that he said to me, you're busy with the work, but have you left your first love? Is your fuel and your flame diminishing right now? Have you become cynical? Have you become dissatisfied? Have you become judgmental? Are you forgiving like you need to forgive? Or are you resentful? Are you spiteful? What is going on in your life, child? Take a look because I'm looking into your heart. He says, remember where you've fallen from, oh, the innocence of love, the innocence of never having had anything happen to you, just trusting like a child. You see, when you're forgiven and when you're healed, that innocence stays with you. It's only when you hang on to things and you let resentment come, insecurity come, hurt come, then it begins to color your heart. But God says, I've washed you. Nothing's going to come into your life that isn't going to go through my lens and my hands of love. I'll never leave you or forsake you. You don't have to fear relationships. You don't have to fear anything. Remember, repent, let grace do her work in you, child. You can't, but I can. And return. Shields up. Shields of faith up. Swords out, hearts clean, hearts pure, hearts ready to love with fresh eyes, ready to go for the second round, phase two, wherever it's going to take us, for this generation that's come, that is ready, phase two. Because this church is not going to be birthed in revival, move into credibility, and die in formal institutionalism. It has the breath of God and the life of God on it. In Jesus' name. But before we leave tonight, I just wanted to do one more thing. And that is now, I, I, as if I haven't gotten up close and personal, I just kind of shared my heart with you. Some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, poor Pastor Jim. This woman is nuts. No, I'm not. I just met, I met the king and I've never been the same. And when you meet Jesus, you're ruined forever for sin. You're ruined forever for the normal life. You have now stepped into the adventure of the kingdom of God and walking by faith. So I need to ask you, have you met him? If I asked you if you walk outside those doors tonight and if you were to die, would you open your eyes in heaven or would you open your eyes in hell? You're saying, oh, well, I hope I'd open my eyes in heaven. I think I'm going to heaven. I'm a pretty good person. But you know, you can't think your way into heaven. You can't hope your way into heaven. And you can't behave your way into heaven. 
God never said the best people are going to heaven. God never said good people are going to heaven. God never said all roads lead to heaven. God never said tolerance is the way. Just tolerate and you'll all get there. God never said that. God said there's only one way to his heaven. He said you must be born again. You see, it's his heaven. This is his world and this is his universe. And it's his way or no way. And he said, you must be born again. What does that mean? It means that you and I can't save ourselves. And that just like we were born as human beings, our spirit being, who we really are, is not going to die. It's just going to be separated from God unless our spirit unless we are born again. Jesus taught that to Nicodemus when dark Jerusalem night, when Nicodemus, a rabbi in Jerusalem, came to Jesus and said, how do I get to heaven? And he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus said, I'm an old man. I can't climb into my mother's womb. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of the law and you don't understand this. What is born of the flesh is flesh. This is your tent. This house is your spirit. But what is born of the spirit is spirit. Your spirit has died Biblical definition of death is separated. Your spirit's been separated by a condition called sin. You're born into it. You can't be good enough to get into heaven. You can't save yourself. There's nothing that you have the ability to do to get you into my heaven. But he said, Nicodemus, I'm going to a cross. And because I love this world and because I have come, to save this world, if you'll look to that cross and you'll believe that I am who I said I am, all God and all man. And you'll surrender your heart and your life to me and you'll let me be your savior and your Lord. Lord means boss. Then you will be born again and I'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness and I'll bring you into the kingdom of God and you'll be reconciled to the Father. There's no other way except through Jesus Christ and the cross. He died for you and I so that you and I could live for him. And if you've never surrendered your heart and your life to him, maybe you've never had the opportunity to leave your first love because you haven't met your first love yet. I'm talking to you. If you've not surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, right now he's knocking on the door of your heart. That's why he brought you here tonight. Because he loves you so much that he couldn't live without you. And he went to that cross. It's a real cross. It really happened. And he is not on that cross and he's not in a grave. He was raised from the dead. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's the only one that can save us. But we have to surrender because, you see, he's done all he can do. It's a gift and only a gift that can be received. He can't force it on us. It has to be our choice. Will we surrender our lives to him and let him be Savior and let him be Lord? So if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, I'm talking to you. Maybe you've served God at one time, but you've walked away and you've backed away and you've not just left your first love, you've walked away from it. And tonight you're here and you know you need to get right with God. I'm talking to you. So I'm just going to count to three. Just tap this microphone. Bang. And I just want you to raise your hand with heads up and eyes open. Look, if I can make a spectacle of myself, you can say yes to Jesus Christ in a safe auditorium. This is why the rock has eyes open, heads up. How can you walk out those doors and serve the master if you can't, in your heart, say yes in this safe and loving place? So, need to get right with God? Need to surrender your heart and life? All over this auditorium, we'll do it at the same time. I'll just count to three and just lift your hand. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. I see that hand. 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 I see. Wow, there's hands going up everywhere. Let's do this because of time. I'd like you to stand with me, everyone. If you just raised your hand or you didn't and you wish you would have, I just want you to stand up right now, slip out of the aisle, grab what you brought to church with you and meet me right here and let's get right with God tonight. Just quickly come. Just quickly come. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. It's not too late if you didn't raise your hand. Just come on down with everybody else. Just get down here. God's moving in this place. 
God's moving in this house. Come and meet the one that made you and loves you and has a plan for your life. Has life to give you. Not condemnation, but life and forgiveness and love. Everything you've ever wanted is only going to be found in Jesus. They're still coming. Just quickly come. Just quickly come. Just quickly come. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on home. Only Jesus. The star breather became the sin bearer. The one that made the galaxies and the universe and everything. The one that has the atoms and the molecules, the neurons counted in our bodies. Not just the hairs of our head. Knows you inside and out. Died for you and I. So that we could love. He became a man. So that we could become sons and daughters of God. What a privilege. Listen, when you were born, he assigned angels to keep you alive, okay? But listen, they're having a party right now. So smile. You're not going to a morgue. You're not dying. You're coming into life. Your sins are forgiven. There's hope in your hearts. There's a brand new way to live. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to take you into our new believers room, because this is a private thing, and we're going to pray with you. You're going to ask Jesus into your heart. And you see, Pastor Dave right here, he's going to take you, and it's not weird. I'm as weird as it gets around here. Trust me. Trust me. And we're going to pray with you, and we're going to explain some things to you. So, Pastor, will you just make a left turn? I think it's left. Yeah, make a left turn. Follow him. Follow him.